Take us away, Owen. At number five in our pressure rankings this morning, we're starting with Mead sympathisers. Those people who have made excuses for Mead football in the past for all their thuggery and their brutish force, they are now under pressure to hold up their end of the bargain and basically argue that Mead weren't all that bad. This comes on the back of the Sean documentary released last Thursday. Could, of course, only be Sean Boylan. And the pot was stirred a little bit more by Tommy Condon yesterday in the Sunday Independent. There was a good discussion about it in the paper review yesterday as well, uh, about how the documentary fails to dig really into the idea that this team were more brutal than any other of that era, perhaps more brutal than any team we've seen in the recent history of Gaelic football. Now, I'm not sure if I'd go along with that point of view. First of all, the, the idea that uh, a manager is intrinsically linked with the identity of a team. That can be true, but I wonder if this is one of these weird moments where this just isn't true, where the, the brute force of me at that point actually with, wasn't uh, a, the part of the boiling psyche. It was independent. They, they just took it on themselves to go out and batter and punch and kick and bite and st- I mean, just completely out of nowhere. Is there a chance that it was a player-led thing? I mean, there is. There is. Look, if you if you think back famously, the players, right? The players had to go and meet Sean Boylan and tell him to put his shyness in his back pocket. That's what they did, right? So, and if if you look at the men that we're talking about here, it's Colm O'Rourke and Joe Castles and Liam Hayes and Mick Lyons, and ultimately. There's, there's a bunch more who kind of come along in that same vein, Martin O'Connell and Robbie O'Malley and Liam Harnan, like Liam Harnan, and uh, McDermott eventually. Like, I'm not sure any of them actually needed too much inspiration to learn how to look after themselves, to use their elbows, just to like create a little bit of space for themselves. I, mm-hmm. There is a possibility. Having said that, at some point, and Tommy Connell made the point in his piece that you know, a manager can rile them up with beautiful words. He can also calm them down to the point where you don't actually need to stand on someone's head to win the match on multiple occasions. Uh, you don't need to go after Canavan's ankles. You, you know, you don't need to take out the best player in the opposition. But maybe you did. Maybe because the rules of the game were not enforced, because referees had absolutely no support, because there was no CCCC to look back at video evidence because there was no video evidence. Like, you got away with stuff where a broken jaw once every couple of years or a broken nose once every six months was the price of doing business. And also, a layer on top of that as well, which we can't forget, is that you mentioned the likes of Canavan there and that incident was mentioned in Conan's article as well yesterday and also Doher getting a bit of harsh treatment. Like, Canavan do her would have been part of one of the more brutish teams we've seen this century. Then, and like uh, I, I, I can't, I can't imagine uh, that Tyrone were any shrinking violets going up against that Mead team. Mayo certainly weren't any shrinking violets going up against them in the '96 All Ireland to the point where you could make a case that, like, we don't know who even started that brawl on that day. Sure, the outcome favoured Mead in the end, but we don't know who started it. The Cork team, that that uh, Mead team, uh, would have tried to rough up a bit would have roughed up pretty much any other team in the, in the country at that point. This was an era where the hard man was at his zenith. Uh, and it is down to a, a number of factors that you mentioned there. Not very much protection from the officials whatsoever. But also because, I mean, there was just a, a physicality in the game there that you could wield and uh, would be rewarded greatly. I like, think I, I can't... fundamentally that's a cultural acceptance of violence. And we had it in Irish society where it was fine to expect people to go to the pub and have a fight after the pub. And every small town in Ireland, outside the chippers, had that culture. And I, you know, I mean, and I, they still had it when we were starting to go out, that you would kind of expect that there would be a fight outside the chippers at some point if you sat there long enough. Uh, but it, like, I, I definitely think, that, and again, Tommy Connell made the point, the game's been cleaned up. I think the game's been cleaned up because there has been proper discipline. Um, and it's not finished. Like, the game is still not, a game where your best players will be allowed to play up against an opponent on the basis of their relative skill and strength. There is still a sense that like you're trying to do lads off the ball and it like it gets it happens less and less. And probably because people feel a little bit less inclined. But I mean look, it's gonna be interesting now over the next couple of months 
as we see so many more club games, how often this actually happens and how often it gets brought to national attention. But I, I do think that that Mead team, their, their ignorance, as, as, as Tommy Rooney would use it, their ignorance was a positive thing, he thinks. Uh, I think that they would have achieved greatness even if they hadn't been thugs. And like there was a thuggishness frequently to their behaviour, which is, is always going to, you know, that, that's part of the DNA of that team. And you can't ignore it. Like, you know, as you say, loads of other teams were thugs at that time. I would, I would absolutely not include the Tyrone team of the Naughties in that, by the way, whatsoever. I think that is revisionism at an extreme scale from you, which speaks to some deeper, hidden, repressed hatred of that team. But not, well, to, not to digress too much. Well, have you seen that? Like, John McEntee would probably beg to differ, I, I suspect. Anyway, um, like... The like, I mean, era, taking the, a knee in the, the face when, you, when you're lying down is probably as bad as anything that me team would have done. But anyway... The era is thuggish. Right, and uh, they were the best team of the era. It's you can't divorce these things, can you? No, you can't. There was a, a essential hallmark to what this mid team was. I'd like, yeah, and they they were the best at doing it. I still I still feel in a in a certain way that they were probably more uh, innovative uh, in these situations than other teams. That <laughs> they were uh, the best dogs. They were the best thugs, yeah. They were definitely smarter. They were definitely luckier in the violent situations as well, like the 96 brawl. Like that was, like if, it, if it goes the other way and Mead's best player gets sent off and uh, somebody who's not Mayo's best player gets sent off, Mayo probably win that All-Ireland. And then all of a sudden we're like, that brawl that Mayo started and how well that turned out for yeah, them. Yeah. Like in, I, just one last thing on this. Like the winners usually write history, except for in GEA, it seems, where the winners are often tired with this thing of, God, they did it in a very dirty way. Remember when uh, Dublin pulled down all those Mayo lads before the All-Ireland in, in 2017? Remember how hard, man, how hard a man Tommy Walsh was when he was kneeing people into the back when he was going up for high balls? It does seem that the winners always come with this caveat of, well, geez, they were, they were bullies and then they were brutal on the pitch. Irish pigudry is, is, is a nice little tasty little element in all of this too. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the perfect Irish stew of what a great team, but what a shower of thugs they were. It's like... It's kind of, it's who we are as a people. What's number four? Yeah. Number four under pressure this week is France Football Magazine. So the pressure on France Football Magazine must be incredible now because calling off the Ballon d'Or was one of the more stupid decisions we've seen in sports during this entire pandemic. It was very like League On getting ahead of themselves and calling off their entire league. Turns out France in general have completely bottled this entire year. So France Football Magazine, who organised the Ballon d'Or, of course, are going to have Robert Lewandowski banging down their door this morning to bring back the award because he is currently the unanimous pick for this award. He scored 13 goals in seven Champions League appearances this term, four behind Ronaldo's haul in one season, his record haul in one season, which is 17. There's a chance he might actually get that despite not having uh, second leg games. Uh, he's already trumped his scoring feats this season, 53 goals across all competitions. Uh, he scored goals in 82% of the matches he's played in. And out of the seven goals that they scored against Chelsea across both legs, Robert Lewandowski scored or assisted in all of those goals. He is the unanimous pick for the Ballon d'Or, but it doesn't exist. Bring it back, France football, is what I'm saying. He's 32 this month as well, like uh, absolutely peaking at this point. And you would feel he's going to be able to do this for another couple of seasons uh, at this point because his game hasn't been based on being the fastest player on the pitch at any point over the course of this. Uh, I really hope that they get beaten this weekend. I've already said that I'm, I'm fully on the Leo Messi needs another Champions League train. And uh, I really hope it's this time because if it's ever going to happen, it's these, these three shortened, like... I can absolutely see him putting in three brilliant performances over the next while, but Graham Hunter made a brilliant case earlier on, if you missed it, that actually what's going to happen here is there is a buzzsaw that they're running into, and that buzzsaw is a Lewandowski-inspired Bayern Munich. So I think you're 100% correct. Like, another premature capitulation from the French. What's going on here? I mean, terrible, terrible, terrible. Who would have thought it from, uh, from the French to, to be able to let down the football community so badly? Uh, right, let's move on to uh, number three, which is Snooker's next generation. So we heard the clip earlier on uh, that Snooker's generation are under a bit of pressure to get the finger out and get good at Snooker. That's all you got to do, just become good at Snooker. Some people won't have seen this. What, so what, ha what happened here? Ronnie O'Sullivan said that he would need to lose an arm and a leg for him to drop out of the top 50 
in the world for uh, snooker. He says that the next generation are rubbish, and that is the reason why players like him have been unable to hang around for so long. He's into the quarterfinals of the world snooker championships and was asked by the BBC that very question, what is the longevity in your career down to? And he basically says, everybody who's come through in snooker recently is shite. And it, like, you'd wonder, is he wrong? Certainly the profile of the game isn't what it once used to be. We certainly look out for players like uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan more than we do for any young player. But if you're uh, one of the younger generation, and when I say younger generation, I mean anybody under the age of uh, 30, 35, uh, playing snooker, listening to this, you're like, Jesus, let me actually get my ass in gear here and prove to you that, no, uh, even if you have all the limbs of your body attached to you, I will be able to beat you in snooker. Like, somebody needs to come and give Ronnie O'Sullivan a good beating, one of these younger players. P potentially, it might never happen. Potentially, you won't see that happen over the next few months. Uh, if for anybody who missed the interview, it's worth digging out. Uh, Eurosport have put it up on their official uh, Twitter channel, so you can see it. But the, at the end of that like little short outburst, it was f less than 50 seconds, the interview goes, well, they're not that bad. Well, but, uh, uh, just in case you say anything else, uh, away we go. I'm like, come on. He's obviously on the verge of unleashing here. Name names. Crack necks, cash checks. Let's see it, Ronnie. <laughs> Uh, this is our Gillette Pressure Rankings. Five is Mead Sympathisers, four is France Football Magazine, three is Snooker's Next Generation. What's number two, Owen? I'm going for Manchester City here. Like You, you, you can replace this with, with any of the, the big three or four teams left in the Champions League if you want, but we've been here before. We know that when you talk the talk of taking a selfie in front of the Sky News story that your European ban has been lifted, you've got to walk the walk by way of actually winning the European competition. Now, of course, they were never going to be banned from this season's competition, but it will still be one of these Twitter moments on uh, at the weekend. It's a Saturday they're playing. It will be one of these Twitter moments where everybody will start sharing the picture of Pep and his mates in that selfie if they get knocked out of the Champions League. They immediately put the pressure on their shoulders where they have to win a Champions League in the next three seasons, and they have a phenomenal chance this year, not least because Bayern Munich and Barcelona have been drawn against each other, I know Graham says that Barcelona aren't much of a challenge to anybody, but it is still Lionel Messi. So either Messi or potentially the, the strongest team in the tournament are going to be taken out, and Manchester City don't need to do the work themselves on Friday night. It is an amazing opportunity for Pep Guardiola. They looked really good on Friday night, although they got very fortuitous. Two big errors from Rafael Varane. This is the opportunity, but it is also the high-pressure scenario for them. It's funny, last week I was going to make the case that uh, why is nobody saying that everybody should be buying Varane? He's a perfect defender. It's getting to that point of his life where he's actually going to be superb. and He'd be brilliant in that. Anyway, I'm glad I never, never actually made that <laughs> point publicly. Uh, number one on your pressure rankings. Brooks Kepka is number one on our pressure rankings this morning. I love Brooks Kepka. Everybody knows that I love, uh, love Brooks Kepka. Uh, but, you know, when you play with fire, you're going to get burned eventually. So on Saturday night, for anybody who missed this, Kepka was asked how he felt about starting the final round of the PGA Championship chasing his good old buddy, Dustin Johnson. So this is a, a year after Johnson nearly ran him down uh, at Bethpage, uh, a two-time uh, defending champion of the event and a four-time major winner, of course. Kepka decided it was time to show Johnson, uh, you know, what it's all about, aka how many majors I've got. And he says, I mean, I like my chances. When I've been in this position before, I've capitalized. I don't know. He's only won one major. Kepka proceeded to shoot a four over par round of 74 yesterday uh, and uh, it was, uh, it's well written on the ESPN website where uh, he beat exactly one player, Jim Herman, out of the 78 he was competing against. So to say that this blew up in his face, to say that the pressure uh, got to him is a, is a bit of an understatement. Afterwards he said, every time I hit it in the rough today, uh, I probably got the worst lie I've had all week. Hey, it wasn't meant to be three in a row. You're not really supposed to do two in a row looking at history, but that's all right. Got two more majors the rest of the season, and we'll figure it out from here. There was a brilliant graphic at the start of coverage where he was going to become the youngest player to win five majors. And, uh, the, and one of the commenters was like, well, I wouldn't mind winning any majors. And I was like, well, actually, this is a good point because it means that you've had this incredible burst at the start of your career, and he would have been on course to be one of the all-time, I mean, he's still on course to be one of the all-time greats if he win, continues to win majors at the pace at which he's won majors. But uh, the, uh, the youngsters coming through, it turns out, are absolutely sensational. Is Roy McIlroy as relevant as a golfer now as he is actually as a businessman and as a, a leader in what, you know, sports, athletes, activism should be? Is, should he not be on your pressure rankings?
it's it's a good point. Like Rory McIlroy comes into the story just by the end of the fact that he defended Dustin Johnson. Like he said, it's hard to knock a guy who's got 21 wins on the PGA Tour, which is three times what Brooks Kepka has. So Rory McIlroy turned into the guy who's like backing up Dustin Johnson, rather than turning into the guy who's actually going to challenge Brooks Kepka and challenge the people who were on 10 under par going into the back nine on a Sunday afternoon. Like, it's, it's been a terrible resumption after the lockdown for Rory McIlroy. What we forget, though, is that he went into lockdown as world number one. He surely has it in him to get into contention in the Sunday of major sometime soon. So okay. I'm not buying that just yet. That, okay. that he is just an activist. Fair enough. We're going to talk with uh, Joe Malloy about the golf in some detail in just a moment. The pressure rankings today, the Gillette pressure rankings, we do them every Monday here. You can uh, get involved. 0879-180-180 is the number to WhatsApp your ideas to. And we have a prize to give away. We give the prize away on tomorrow's show for uh, people who've been suggesting stuff for us. Um, there is some breaking news. Jaden Sancho has boarded the plane to Switzerland with Dortmund for their training camp. Should Ed Woodward be number one on the pressure rankings? We're going to come back to this during deal or no deal with Phil in just a couple of minutes' time.